everyone know her now, uh, potential head of school, and <laughs> definitely the f one of the founder of the 464 group. So, Anna was mentioned already in Torsten Talk. He was not here, but really? he was mentioned, yeah. Oh, and I hope in good... Very in good. Yeah, no. mentioned okay. handsome and one of the best students. Anyway, Hannah did his PhD here with Torsten and developed the serious resistance uh, imaging that um, is uh, commonly used in the BT imaging tool. After that, he worked quite a lot on the characterization, so he led the characterization team and the was in charge of the characterization room for many years. Um, he focused on almost every characterization, but mainly on PL. Uh, so the micro PL system that we have um, was developed by Hannah in his grant. Um, his new uh, baby is a PDS, mm. we can say that. Yeah. So we asked Hannah to speak a bit because we don't use PDS too often and it's quite powerful tool, so it's worth to everyone to have a bit of feeling about what is PDS, how it can be used, uh, how you can take it to your research. So please welcome Henna. Thank you, Ziv. That was a lovely introduction. Um, yeah, so my name is Henna, um, and my new baby is uh, photothermal deflection spectroscopy, and I bet most of you guys haven't heard about that. Um, and therefore, I thought I'd talk a little bit about it. So, um, in my little talk, I want to talk about uh, why photo absorption measurement is actually important and why we care, and what kind of limitation we actually see there if we measure materials. And uh, then, uh, how we can overcome these limitations, and there I go into the PDS, which is an old solution, and why it's old and how it's working, I will explain there. And then, of course, what we do here at UNSW with the PDS and future plans. The last two points are a little bit shorter. Uh, so if you make it until the end of uh, the second section there, you have actually almost survived my talk. Um, so first of all, why, why do we actually care about optical absorption? First of all, because we are all working with solar cells, we want to convert the external quantum efficiency to internal quantum efficiency. Uh, for people who are not familiar with quantum efficiency, that is, you want to know how many photons that you shine onto um, a solar cell are actually converted to electrical current, right? And uh, that is the external quantum efficiency, and you have to correct it with photons that are reflected from the front surface or like are going through the material, um, and that is usually where, where the absorption comes in. Right? The internal quantum efficiency is how, how many of the absorbed uh, photons, like the photons that got stuck in, in the solar cell, are actually then converted to electrical current. And here you can see in this graph on the x-axis you have the wavelength, and on the y-axis you have in percentage the internal quantum efficiency, external quantum efficiency, and reflectance transmission, or one minus absorptance, it's the same thing. Uh, so in red you have the uh, external quantum efficiency, and if you correct it by the by the blue, cur uh, by the blue uh, curve, you get the internal quantum efficiency, and that tells you a lot of things about uh, how good your light management is uh, for the solar cell, um, but also the, um, uh, the electrical characteristics. So, so if you have a lot of absorption on the front surface and how the, um, how the longer wavelengths are uh, dealt with. So uh, another important thing is for all the people who are working with thin film materials, right? For example, Gavin's group, who is, uh, who is dealing with uh, quantum materials, um, you, we have CZTS, we have perovskite in, uh, in, our, in our school. They all have thin film materials and they are changing band cap energies and they have defects and, and things like this. And of course, they want to measure this, right? Like, uh, if you have the band to band um, edge, the absorptance kind of falls, falls off. Uh, the material becomes more and more uh, uh, transmissive. And then, of course, like uh, below band cap energies, you have again a little bit absorption um, on the defect states. So you can all measure them. And for material that is not very crystalline, you also have an uh, Erbach trail, uh, which is the exponential decay um, after the band to band gap edge. And so it, it gives you some kind of information of how crystalline your material is. So usually we measure the absorptance 
um, with a reflectance transmission spectrometer. So here we have a Perkin Elmer. It's just an example. We have that in 140, in one of our main characterization rooms. And how it's doing is uh, it has a, um, a monochromatic light. It shines on the material and it knows how much light that is. It is, it is measuring how much is reflected and how much is transmitted. And the difference between the incident light uh, and the reflected and transmitted has to be the photons that got stuck in the material, so the absorbed stuff. Uh, so that is pretty much how it's calculating it. It's one, so the instant photo flux minus reflectance minus transmission, and that is the absorptance. So this is how the system is calculating it. It, it is a straightforward thing, uh, but there are some problems. First problem is noise, of course. As further you go into the infrared, uh, as more you have detector noise. And everyone who has worked with um, photo detectors knows um, as, as longer the detector is sensitive to uh, infrared, uh, as smaller the band gap and as more thermal noise you get into that. So here it starts at uh, 2000 nanometer and you can see you have, uh, you have noise there. In this graph you see again on the x-axis wavelengths and the other one is transmission. Um, what we measure there is basically nothing, right? So we have no sample that we are measuring there. This, so it's basically a, a calibration run, a second calibration run after the first calibration run. And uh, what we should see is just uh, a straight line at 100%, right? Like all the light that is just going through. So there, there should nothing happen, but you can see you have noise there. Um, uh, when you go into a longer infrared. And um, then you also have detector change problems. Right? Um, all optical detectors have a specific wavelength range where they're sensitive to, and then you are below, like if you go further into infrared, you become uh, less sensitive, you're below band cap energy, and then you need another detector which has a smaller band cap to be sensitive again. So on the left side, shorter wavelengths, um, that's a silicon detector. On, on the right hand side, that's the ingas detector. And you can see uh, at the transition from detector to detector, you have again noise. And you can't get rid of that. That's, that's always there. Even if you do a calibration run after a couple of minutes, the temperature is slightly different and then you have again like a little step. Um, yeah, so you're always dealing with these two problems. There are more problems um, if you have um, some samples that have uh, different reflective properties depending on polarization. That's an entire different topic. So this is only the tip of the iceberg kind of thing. But these two problems you always see. Here we have the uh, transmission, but you have again the same problem with the reflectance. So you have this kind of problem is like you have to multiply it by two. Uh, so for all these transmission and reflectance spectrometers, which are super common, you always have the problem of that you have some kind of noise limit or like accuracy limit. And usually I would say it's 1% and everything that is below that you really have to take care of how you measure it, repeat it many times, make a sanity check if it actually makes, makes sense what you're doing there. Um, so you could maybe go down to half a percent. You can trust the data and then it becomes really iffy. And that actually creates the question, what do you do if you have less absorption? For example, if you are interested in the spectral range that is below band cap energy. For example, have you ever tried to measure silicon beyond 1300 nanometer? It becomes really, really transparent. Um, or if you have thin films, for example, Gavin's quantum dot materials, um, where you have very little absorption because the material is very thin, right? As thinner you get, as less you have interaction uh, distance with the light, and less actually is absorbed. Um, so these are the two problems what you do with very, weak, um, with very weak absorption. The other problem is, for example, for the thin film people, uh, they have thin films on a substrate, for example, quartz glass. How do you separate the quartz glass absorption with the thin film? So these are all problems that come to your mind when you're working on these materials. Um, and that was uh, the problem that uh, Binish, a colleague of mine, also a member of the famous 464 group, um, uh, had to deal with. That was three years ago. He was working with Gavin Connabier, um, and Gavin came to him and said, like, look, I can't measure my quantum materials in this INT technique. 
I would really want to know what uh, defects we have in the material, what the optical band cap is, if I change process parameters. And Binish said, like, okay, like I, I look into this. And so he found the PDS system, or PDS technique which stands for photothermal deflection spectroscopy. And in sometimes in literature, it's also referred as the mirage cantilever effect. And what that actually means, I will come, come into that in a second. Um, it is an old technique. So it was uh, done 1981 by Jackson. He proposed it in a very nice paper where he kind of pretty much laid out the entire theory, everything, uh, limits and things like this. And Wiener said, okay, fantastic. We will build it here in in the university and it took him actually two and a half years before it was operational. So it took much longer than it was actually anticipated. The advantage of this is um, the minimum absorption that you can measure. So the RNT is about 1%. The, the PDS is a um, thousand times more sensitive. So it is incredibly sensitive, so it should be good on, on thin films. Uh, it is insensitive to the substrate. Um, Shot. I want to explain this. Um, so the X and the O uh, is often used in Japan and I always wondered what it's actually meaning. So the O means OK and the X means no way. So <laughs> just in case you want to book a hotel in Japan, like often it's marked if a, if a room is available or not as an X and O and I always like had no idea what that means. Anyway, so, um, so the PDS is insensitive to, to substrate, so, so it's OK. Um, it's also insensitive to scattered light. So if your surface is a little bit rough, for the INT technique, you need an integration sphere that is kind of collecting all the light that is like scattering in different directions. The PDS, you don't have to worry about it. It always works. Another cool thing is there are no detector changes. Even if you go into like far infrared, like um, 25 micrometer wavelength, the PDS still works because the detector is actually the sample by itself. And it's quite awesome if you think about that. So um, the mirage effect, right? So I want to go into the, into the term mirage cantilever effect. So the mirage, what is the mirage? Exactly what you thought about. This is kind of the reflections that you see in the desert and then on hot days, kind of the ground looks like it's wet, but it's actually not. It's just a reflection of the sky. And how that actually works is um, shown in this one. Um, the air just, just above the, the hot ground, the hot sand in the desert, for example, um, is, is hotter than the air further above. And therefore, it is less dense, right? As hotter air gets, as less dense it is, and as, less, uh, or, or as lower the optical refractive index. And light always bends towards the higher refractive index. So basically, you're looking into the ground, but actually what you're seeing is the sky. Right? So what you're seeing there is not wet sand, it is actually the sky. And we are using exactly, or this technique uses exactly the same uh, thing. Instead of sand or the ground, we have the thin film, and instead of air, we have liquid. But the principle is exactly the same. So the system actually starts like also the RNT technique. So we have a light source and we have a monochromator, so we only have one wavelength of light. And we have a reference detector that kind of so we know how much light we're actually dealing with. And uh, then we have the sample in a liquid. Here it is uh, carbon tetrachloride. Uh, chloride, tetrachloride. Um, why, why that liquid? I come to that in a second. And uh, we have a laser beam that just glazes over the surface of the sample and is then in a distance detected by a position detector. So we can see where the laser is actually hitting. And how it works is so if we let the light, the monochromatic light shine onto the material, it heats up the material, right? So whatever is absorbed is kind of thermalizing down, it's kind of creating heat, and it's heating the surrounding liquid. And it creates kind of like a little dome of less dense liquid because it's a little bit hotter. So you're creating a little lens, right? And that is deflecting the, uh, the laser beam, and you can measure this in, in the distance, so it's deflecting a little bit. And as longer you, um, you do this, as more it's deflecting until it found its thermal, uh, thermal stable state and kind of stays there. And of course, you can do this often. Uh, you, know, you can switch it on and off, on and off, and you can see how the laser beam is actually dancing up and down. And that's a direct indicator of how much light is absorbed. Um, 
So why liquid? Uh, liquid has a, um, or this particular liquid has a high uh, temperature dependency of the refractive index. So it has a stronger lens effect than if you would just use air. And it's also less turbulent. Uh, uh, so it's actually, it's, it actually works much better than if you just use water or, or air. Um, but there are also other, uh, other um, materials that you can use um, or other liquids like some alcohols are quite good for this as well. Um, and the other requirement is just it has to be transparent, obviously. In terms of uh, equation, um, so you can see it is working with, with heat. So actually you have to um, uh, solve the entire heat equation uh, and that uh, that's can be quite painful. Um, if you use uh, some approximation, this equation becomes much simpler. So if you just say that the, um, uh, the probing light beam has to be re reasonably small and the substrate um, has a lower absorption coefficient than actually the thin film that you want to measure, then the equation becomes much simpler. So the deflection distance S uh, is, um, is a function of what comes after that. So you have a, a calibration constant, you have a uh, relative temperature sensitivity of your liquid, distance of integration and temperature gradient within the film, which is all constant, right? So you don't have to worry about that. Once you have calibrated your system, that's pretty much all set. And then you have the modulation speed intense, uh, dependency. And that is something really cool. So if you modulate very fast, so if you switch on and off your, um, your monochromatic light very fast, then um, uh, then light that is gener no heat that is generated from the surface has more effect. Everything that is generated further in 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 the substrate or deeper down needs time for the heat to actually come up to the surface. So it has a phase lag. Um, so and you can separate this um, by changing the modulation frequency of how fast you basically pulse it. So you can actually get a little bit depth information of where light is absorbed. You can use this. Um, you can simplify this equation even further if you say oh, the film is very thin so you don't have to have a gradient in your th very thin film and uh, if you have a 100% reflective, 100% uh, absorptive reference material or another reference point that you have measured somewhere else, somewhere else in the spectrum where it's easier accessible, then you can, um, then you can normalize the entire thing and that is all what is, what is then left. So uh, you have uh, the absorption coefficient alpha and the thickness of your thin layer L. That's all what you have and uh, one minus the entire exponent uh, then you have the um, absorptance of your film. So it's, it, it becomes really really simple. Um, so the absorption limit actually calculates out of that it is 0.001 percent instead of 0.5 percent of the INT technique. So it's are significantly more sensitive. Um, for people who are a little bit more interested in the technical side, and I bet Ivan will ask that, um, what is the temperature difference or, of the material that you, could uh, that you could measure there? It's only 100 picokelvin and I think that's the most sensitive temperature detector I've actually come across. Um, and the, the beam is deflected only then a very, very little bit, which is 0 0.6 milli-degrees, which is also very, very little bit. So, um, so what does it actually mean in terms of samples that you can measure? And that makes sense to see it actually on sample thickness. So in this graph you have the sample thickness uh, in the x-axis on logarithmic scale and uh, on the y-axis you have the um, absorption coefficient, one, one over centimeter. The blue line shows the RNT uh, technique with this half a percent uh, absorption limit. It can measure everything that is above that line. And the PDS, the line is much lower and can measure everything above that. Um, what it actually shows here is, um, so either you have much more uh, absorption coefficient to work with for the same thickness of sample, or you can go for the same thing that you want to measure to much thinner samples with the PDS system. So what it means, you can measure exactly the same thing with PDS than with RNT, but you can do this also on 500 times thinner samples. And that is a big deal for people who are working with thin films. Right? That's a direct comparison. Another example is uh, if we look in, uh, into silicon. Right? 
Uh, this graph I stole from uh, PVCD-ROM and I deleted all the other absorption curves uh, from, uh, from the other semiconductor. So this is only silicon left. Again, uh, absorption coefficient on the y-axis and wavelengths on the, um, the x-axis. If you have silicon that is thicker than 40 micrometers, and most times we're working with this, other, unless we're working with thin film samples, then INT and PDS, they are both happy. You can measure this entire curve, no problem. There's no need to use PDS. Just, just, just use your Perkin Elmer or other uh, photothermal spectrum uh, or other INT spectrometer. However, if you go to 0.1 micrometer, then the entire thing looks completely different. The INT technique can only measure part of it. So everything that is below 850 nanometers, the INT can still measure everything that is above that. The sample is just too, too, too weak absorbance and the INT technique fails then. However, the uh, PDS technique can measure the entire thing then again. So that, that is actually the, the, that shows you very clear that you can go to much thinner samples and still measure. Another example comes from Gavin's group that is hydrogenated amorphous silicon. Um, he had one sample that was uh, much thinner than the other one. So the red one is 260 nanometer thick, the, uh, the black one is 1700 nanometer thick. And um, after a certain wavelength, um, so again, on the, on the x-axis, the energy is in reverse. So the longer wavelengths is again on the right-hand side, shorter wavelengths on the left-hand side. Um, on the y-axis, you have the absorption coefficient. Um, you can see you have a separation then at, at, um, at longer wavelengths or uh, lower energies. Um, and that is basically the defects that he had in the material. Um, you can also see in that uh, is um, you have certain inter interference fringes. That is when the refractive index has a big step from the thin film that you want to measure to the substrate. As, as more step you have there, as the stronger the interference fringes are. And as, uh, as far they are um, uh, separated, you can calculate also the thickness of your film. That gives you kind of a sanity check if you're actually dealing with the right thickness of um, of layer that you're measuring. So um, quite interesting. So all this defect absorption that you can see there circled uh, wouldn't be able to be measured in an INT technique. So you have to use a PDS system for, for this kind of stuff. Um, so PDS at UNSW. Um, so we had some difficulties, or Beanish had some difficulties, and, and he had to go through them. Um, pretty much there had been like the, the alignment Right. The entire thing becomes very alignment sensitive. The probe laser has to be less than 100 micrometers away from the surface. So very, very close. And then you know, the angle you have to get right and stuff like this. So, so the alignment from, from sample to sample has to be done very, very carefully. Uh, then also the entire thing became vibration uh, sensitive. Um, as I mentioned before in the slide, you only, like if you want to go to the limit of sensitivity of the PDS, you only have zero, half a degree of, half a milli degree of, uh, uh, of deflection. At, at a half a meter distance, there are about six to seven micrometer deflection that you have to measure. And then you can imagine, like, whenever the building vibrates, the floor, the street and stuff like this, you will see this much more than actually the, the six micrometer. Six micrometer is about one-tenth of a human hair, just to give you uh, intuitive kind of feeling of how much that is. So everything had to be vibration isolated. And then we had also air movement and that was something that Wiener struggled quite a bit with because it was not very intuitive. Um, that, is, that is this. Um, so in this system you can see here you have the, the light source monochromator and back there you have the, uh, the sample stage um, with a detector um, and the position detector and laser. So, and what we actually noticed, or what took a little bit of time was, when you switch on the system, everything is good. And then after like 20 seconds, the signal becomes really noisy and not good anymore. And it took a long time until he actually realized the air from the lamp is coming out, is then deflected from the wall, 
and finds its way back, back there where the, where the sample is and where the cantilever effect is actually happening and messes up his signal. So he actually found out by rolling up a, a poster and shove it in, uh, in front of the ventilator so to direct the air somewhere else. And that solved the problem. So all these kind of things uh, are experimental things where you kind of find out the quirks and tricks of the system. And Lucia, my student who is doing very uh, experimental work, knows about this. Uh, sometimes it takes a very, very long time to find something very trivial that you have never thought of. But that's, that's, that's one of the examples where, where Beanish had to go through. Um, this is the cuvette and the sample holder. Uh, so that is a fairly small thing, uh, one centi by, uh, by one centimeter, the base uh, of it. So you have a fairly small substrate um, sample. Um, it is clamped um, by, the, by the lid and then put into, the, uh, into a cuvette, uh, which is then filled with a liquid. And then it is placed there in a sample holder, which has an automated rotation and translation stage. So, and on the right hand side, you can see this, this black thing is actually a camera. So you can actually see what, you, uh, what you're doing and how to align it. Uh, so it's a little bit of a fiddly thing. And, and, and so that's, that's what, uh, what he did. So the future plans are basically to miniaturize this entire thing. Uh, we want to um, make it alignment free. So if you put a new sample in there, you don't have to go through this entire alignment process to get the laser like parallel to the surface and very close um, because that's, that's quite time intensive. We would like to make it automated. So it's just a one button thing that you don't have to go through a lengthy training and so more people can use it. We want to make it more reliable so it spits out the same results each time when you do it. Um, and of course, like miniaturized um, and a tabletop unit. Right now it's on an optical bench, so it's like two meter long and like it's kind of, it's not very handy. And um, in terms of collaboration, yes, we want to have uh, more experimental experience. Um, try different samples, um, get a little bit more thoughts of how to do uh, the interpretation of the data, of course, um, and exchange thoughts on user friendliness. And as you can see, these points there are not a typical research project, right? It's more like product development. And that is exactly where it goes to. So we want to commercialize it, actually. Uh, it's a little company that I uh, founded on my, uh, on my spare time. And then uh, Binish said, hey, why don't you do the PDS thing? And, and so that was last year, I think. Yeah, end of last year. And, we thought, and I thought, like, yeah, that's a cool idea. And, and Michael Pollard is now the, uh, the UNSW collaborator. And he's kind of also on board. And together, we want to kind of develop it and make it make a market entry uh, next year. And this up there is actually uh, an AutoCAD drawing of a system that we are building right now. So it's, it's not really big. It's kind of like really a tabletop size. And that along this line, it will be an industrial first prototype. So that is, that's what we're doing. And that is where my passion is right now to kind of build this system and kind of make it available for more people. And that is already the end of my talk. Thank you very much. Was it in time? Uh, so, do you intend to commercialize it in the first place? Because it's not very more a new technology. Why don't you just buy the equipment? Uh, you can't. There's no company that is in the market that is offering this. So, all the PDS technologies, the people are just compact. All the PDS. And I mean, there are tons of publications and people who have built it themselves, right? But uh, it's not straightforward to build it. So you need about like two years of a postdoc to like fiddle around with this. And that's quite a lot of money. So a lot of people are a little bit, or like a lot of research groups would like to have it, but they don't want to go through the pain and wait for two years until someone has built it or might not have built it successfully. So, um, and we can see that there's a certain advantage, especially for thin film research and, and for material research in general that is working with thin films, um, that, that we think there's actually a market. And surprisingly, there's no, no one in the market, even though that the technique is known for 30 years. So that's, that's what we thought.
Question from Aldo. You mentioned there was also a time dependence you can maybe get from the, the temperature diffusion inside. I guess that's it's very appealing for us. So if you try to fit some model systems to see how accurate that is. We haven't done that yet. It's interesting. Oh, yeah. We just noticed that there is a there is a phase lag, yeah. and and we can see cl uh, clearly see this when we are like, yeah, nice. yeah. But we haven't we haven't put it in the equation that it's kind of automatically spitting out yeah. results. Ivan. So uh, thank you for letting us know where where it is at now. Yeah. Um, so I have a couple of questions uh, and, and maybe a couple of important clarifications. I think um, maybe the first one is. Um, it's important to get data, which is what you've been trying to do, but then the interpretation of it is very important. So for example, if you go to the, the, the data where there is absorption, now that, this one? Yeah. yeah. Those two to me are interference. Yes. But you're calling it defect absorption where that interferes. So that if you go to the previous uh, expression, you assume uh, one more and one more. You assume a single pass. Yes. And that's very inaccurate in this range where you have almost no absorption. So that's what makes it necessary for you to do uh, actual. Uh, it's not straightforward to extract the information. No, no, no. But I wanted to like. Okay. Okay. No, I limit the time here. Like okay. That's, okay. That's okay. So I just, I just, I yeah. wasn't sure that you were actually extracting it all because. That data of the absorption seems to me that it's not. It's absorption still without removing the yeah. the optical effects. Yeah. Okay. Um, and uh, so the other thing that was uh, following up on this uh, time delay thing, um, it's limited by the thermal properties of the material, not necessarily any other time dependent uh, effects in your material, right? Yes. And so it's actually very well known. You can actually determine then based on the phase, where the absorption is happening. Yes, so, yeah. especially like if you use a standard substrate like um, quartz glass or something like this, where all these thermal properties are well known. Mm -hmm. right? You can immediately plug it in and uh, get really good results. So, so that's, that's, I think, the, the beauty of this. Mm -hmm. and if you have a substrate that is less well known, then, it's be it, then it becomes a little bit more complicated. But, but um, you can characterize it with your PDF. We could characterize it, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, it's, a, it's a very exciting that if it is possible to have it uh, be uh, straightforward to use, um, that it would be good to, to have this. Mm. Uh, I think it, it would be also very uh, neat for you to, to, to talk about all the things that you have done to simplify some of the requirements, like the, when I started putting it together, you had it, you, I, I was looking at an ultra stable pointing laser and things like that, where I think you've come up with really great ideas as to how to get rid of that. So maybe that's your secret as of now until your, your we, company we, is. Yes, we haven't decided on what we actually want to IP protect and what not. Okay. So I don't want to like just blur out everything and then like later I can't. Yeah, no, I think that you guys have come up with uh, amazing <coughs> ideas, that, you know, very new ideas on, on PDS that, that people that have put this together have not used. So. In, I'm very, very, very looking forward to to your system. Yeah, me too. <laughs> More question? Really? So, thank you. That was really clear. Um, one thing that I that made you explain that I didn't catch was how do you calibrate the absorption? Because you have this deflection of laser beam, like that, and yeah. it's very sensitive. Yeah. Yeah, but if you're talking about very small absorptions. It is, it is a relative measurement. So um, you have the reference of the light source, the, like the light that you're shining on there, like always, right? Like, so that it was like, right after the monochromator, you have a reference. And, and that is, that, that's fairly clear. Um, and then the entire um, curve of the, how much deflection you get for each wavelength, that is then a relative measurement, right? So entire spectrum that you get is, is relative and you have to pinpoint it somewhere like on to get the absolute value. So you could either go to a Perkin Elmer or something like this or like a INT technique and use part of the spectrum that you can easily measure just one point and you can just shift the entire thing to where you want it. Or you need an extra sample with a, uh, a thin layer of 100% absorbing things or like close to 100% absorbing 
on the same substrate and, and do a reference kind of check to, to pin everything to, to the right level. Um, yes, so that is most RT. Yeah, so yeah, it, it is a relative technique that has to be pinned somewhere with some kind of reference or with some kind of uh, other technique, yes. Um, what about, what if your film is um, soluble in carbon tetrachloride? How versatile are you in the, in the choice of solvent that you can use? There, there are several ones. So there are alcohols that you can use. Um, I saw uh, some papers from Japan actually where they used air, just, just normal air. Um, if you, if you got, go to gases, they, they're more turbulent. So actually to have them well behaved, because you still have a cantilever, blah, 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 and each kind of air kind of movement uh, kind of messes things up. So um, gas as a medium is more complicated, but there are several alcohols and, and even water would work. So there's always some kind of liquid where things don't dissolve in. So it, it's just a question of what you choose. Yeah. Chlorine air. They were using chlorine air, yeah. remember? Yeah. And that one is... You know. it, it's, it's pretty nice material, yes. And, and not as toxic as the carbon fluoride current tetra for us, yeah. And mainly because it doesn't interact with, with the sample. So if you have something that dissolves, fluorine would be the best way to go. But you lose some sensitivity then. Okay. More questions for Hannah? Okay. So let's thank Hannah again.